world. And now it is again rising on the very horizon of the east, the borders of the Sanpo, a thousandfold more effulgent than it ever was before. Today, the 26th of September, 1893, is the penultimate day of this Parliament of Religions at Chicago. We have listened to engrossing discourses on the religions and theologies of the participating countries in these past two weeks. In continuing the series, Swami Vivekananda will now speak on Buddhism, the fulfillment of Hinduism. The religion of the Hindus is divided into two parts, the ceremonial and the spiritual. The spiritual portion is specially studied by the monks. In that, there is no caste. A man from the highest caste and a man from the lowest may become a monk in India, and the two castes become equal. In religion, there is no caste. Caste is simply a social institution. When Buddha was teaching, Sanskrit was no more the spoken language in India. It was then only in the books of the learned. Some of Buddha's Brahmin disciples wanted to translate his teachings into Sanskrit, but he distinctly told them, I am for the poor, for the people. Let me speak in the tongue of the people. And so, to this day, the great bulk of his teachings are in the vernacular of that day in India. Whatever may be the position of philosophy, whatever may be the position of metaphysics, so long as there is such a thing as death in the world, so long as there is such a thing as weakness in the human heart, so long as there is a cry going out of the heart of man in his very weakness, there shall be a faith in God. Let us then join the wonderful intellect of the Brahmin with the heart, the noble soul, the wonderful humanizing power of the great master. Ladies and gentlemen, in a short while from now, the world's Parliament of Religions at Chicago will come to a close. And this day, the 27th of September, 1893, will go down in history as a landmark for more reasons than one. It is in the fitness of things that we now call upon Swami Vivekananda from India to address this final session. The world's parliament of religions has become an accomplished fact, and the merciful Father has helped those who labored to bring it into existence and crowned with success their most unselfish labor. My thanks to those noble souls whose large hearts and love of truth first dreamt this wonderful dream and then realized it. My thanks to the shower of liberal sentiments that has overflowed this platform. My thanks to this enlightened audience for their uniform kindness to me and for their appreciation of every thought that tends to smooth the friction of religions. A few jarring notes were heard from time to time in this harmony. My special thanks to them for they have, by their striking contrast, made the general harmony the sweeter. Much has been said of the common ground of religious unity. I am not going just now to venture my own theory, but if anyone here hopes that this unity will come by the triumph of any one of the religions and the destruction of the others, to him I say, Brother, yours is an impossible hope. Do I wish that the Christian would become Hindu? God forbid! Do I wish that a Hindu or Buddhist would become Christian? God forbid! The seed is put in the ground, and earth and air and water are placed around it. Does the seed become the earth or the air or the water? No. The Vedas teach that the soul is divine, only held in the bondage of matter. Perfection will be reached 
when this bond will burst and the word they use for it is therefore mukti freedom freedom from the bonds of imperfection freedom from death and misery and this bondage can only fall off through the mercy of god and this mercy comes on the pure so purity is the condition of his mercy how does that mercy act he reveals himself to the pure heart the pure and the stainless see god ye even in this life then and then only all the crookedness of the heart is made straight then all doubt ceases he is no more the freak of a terrible law of causation this is the very center the very vital conception of hinduism the hindu does not want to live upon words and theories if there are existences beyond the ordinary sensuous existence he wants to come face to face with them if there is a soul in him which is not full universal soul he will go to him direct he must see him and that alone can destroy all doubts so the best proof a hindu sage gives about the soul about god is i have seen the soul i have seen god and that is the only condition of perfection the hindu religion does not consist in struggles and attempts to believe a certain doctrine or dogma but in realizing not in believing but in being and becoming thus the whole object of their system is by constant struggle to become perfect to become divine to reach god and see god and this reaching god seeing god becoming perfect even as the father in heaven is perfect constitutes the religion of the hindus and what becomes of a man when he attains perfection he lives a life of bliss infinite he enjoys infinite and perfect bliss having obtained the only thing in which man ought to have pleasure namely god and enjoys the bliss with god so far all the hindus are agreed this is the common religion of all the sects of india but when perfection is absolute and the absolute cannot be two or three it cannot have any qualities it cannot be an individual and so when a soul becomes perfect and absolute it must become one with brahma and it would only realize the lord as the perfection the reality of its own nature and existence the existence absolute knowledge absolute and bliss absolute we have often and often read this called the losing of individuality and becoming a stock or a stone he just said scars that never felt a wound i tell you it is nothing of the kind if it is happiness to enjoy the consciousness of this small body it must be greater happiness to enjoy the consciousness of two bodies the measure of happiness increasing with the consciousness of an increasing number of bodies the aim the ultimate of happiness being reached when it would become a universal consciousness therefore to gain this infinite universal individuality this miserable little prison individuality must go then alone can death cease when i am one with life then alone can misery cease when i am one with happiness itself then alone can all error cease when i am one with knowledge itself and this is the necessary scientific conclusion science has proved to me that physical individuality is a delusion that really my body is one little continuously changing body in an unbroken ocean of matter and adwaita or unity is the necessary conclusion with my other counterpart soul science is nothing but the finding of unity as soon as science would reach perfect unity it would stop from further progress because it would reach the goal thus chemistry could not progress farther when it would discover one element out of which all others could be made physics would stop when it would be able to fulfill its services in discovering one energy of which all the others are but manifestations and the science of religion become perfect when it would discover him who is the one life in a universe of death him who is the constant basis of an ever changing world 
one who is the only soul of which all souls are but delusive manifestations. Thus is it, through multiplicity and duality, that the ultimate unity is reached. Religion can go no farther. This is the goal of all science. All science is bound to come to this conclusion in the long run. Manifestation and not creation is the word of science today. And the Hindu is only glad that what he has been cherishing in his bosom for ages is going to be taught in more forcible language and with further light from the latest conclusions of science. Descend we now from the aspirations of philosophy to the religion of the ignorant. At the very outset, I may tell you that there is no polytheism in India. In every temple, if one stands by and listens, one will find the worshippers applying all the attributes of God, including omnipresence, to the images. It is not polytheism, nor would the name henotheism explain the situation. The rose, called by any other name, would smell as sweet. Names are not explanations. The tree is known by its fruits. When I have seen amongst them that are called idolaters, men, the like of whom, in morality and spirituality and love, I have never seen anywhere, I stop and ask myself, can sin beget holiness? Superstition is a great enemy of man, but bigotry is worse. Why does a Christian go to church? Why is the cross holy? Why is the face turned toward the sky in prayer? Why are there so many images in the Catholic Church? Why are there so many images in the minds of Protestants when they pray? My brethren, we can no more think about anything without a mental image than we can live without breathing. By the law of association, the material image calls up the mental idea and vice versa. This is why the Hindu uses an external symbol when he worships. He will tell you it helps to keep his mind fixed on the being to whom he prays. He knows, as well as you do, that the image is not God, is not omnipresent. After all, how much does omnipresence mean to almost the whole world? It stands merely as a word, a symbol. Has God superficial area? If not, when we repeat that word omnipresent, we think of the extended sky or of space. That is all. As we find that somehow or other, by the laws of our mental constitution, we have to associate our ideas of infinity with the image of the blue sky or of the sea, so we naturally connect our idea of holiness with the image of a church, a mosque or a cross. The Hindus have associated the ideas of holiness, purity, truth, omnipresence and such other ideas with different images and forms. But with this difference, that while some people devote their whole lives to their idol of a church and never rise higher, because with them religion means an intellectual assent to certain doctrines and doing good to their fellows, the whole religion of the Hindu is centered in realization. Man is to become divine by realizing the divine. Idols or temples or churches or books are only the supports, the helps of his spiritual childhood, but on and on he must progress. He must not stop anywhere. External worship, material worship, say the scriptures, is the lowest stage. Struggling to rise high, mental prayer is the next stage. But the highest stage is when the Lord has been realized. Mark, the same earnest man who is kneeling before the idol tells you, him the sun cannot express, nor the moon, nor the stars, the lightning cannot express him, nor what we speak of as fire. Through him they shine. But he does not abuse anyone's idol or call its worship sin. He recognizes in it a necessary stage of life. The child is father of the man. Would it be right for an old man to say that childhood is a sin or youth is a sin? If a man can realize his divine nature with the help of an image, would it be right to call that a sin? Nor, even when he has passed that stage, should he call it an error. To the Hindu, man is not traveling from error to truth, but from truth to truth, from lower to higher truth, 
to him all the religions from the lowest fetishism to the highest absolutism mean so many attempts of the human soul to grasp and realize the infinite each determined by the conditions of its birth and association and each of these marks a state and every soul is a young eagle soaring gathering more glorious sun unity in variety is the plan of nature and the hindu has recognized it every other religion lays down certain fixed dogmas and tries to force society to adopt them it places before society only one code which must fit jack and john and henry all alike if it does not fit john or henry he must go without a coat to cover his body the hindus have discovered that the absolute can only be realized or thought of or stated through the relative and the images crosses and crescents are simply so many symbols so many pegs to hang spiritual ideas on it is not that this help is necessary for everyone but those that do not need it have no right to say that it is wrong nor is it compulsory in hinduism one thing i must tell you idolatry in india does not mean anything horrible it is not the mother of harlots on the other hand it is the attempt of undeveloped minds to grasp high spiritual truths the hindus have their faults they sometimes have their exceptions but mark this they are always for punishing their own bodies and never for cutting the throats of their neighbors if the hindu fanatic burns himself on the pyre he never lights the fire of inquisition and even this cannot be laid at the door of his religion any more than the burning of witches can be laid at the door of christianity to the hindu then the whole world of religions is only a traveling a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal every religion is only evolving a god out of the material man and the same god is the inspirer of all of them why then are there so many contradictions they are only apparent says the hindu the contradictions come from the same truth adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures it is the same light coming through glasses of different colors and these little variations are necessary for purposes of adaptation but in the heart of everything the same truth reigns the lord has declared to the hindu in his incarnation as krishna i am in every religion as a thread through a string of pearls wherever thou see this an expanding and purifying you that i am there and what has been the result i challenge the world to find throughout the whole system of sanskrit philosophy any such expression as that the hindu alone will be saved and not others says vyasa we find perfect men even beyond the pale of our caste and creed one thing more how then can the hindu whose whole fabric of thought centers in god believe in buddhism which is agnostic or in jainism which is atheistic the buddhists or the jains do not depend upon god but the whole force of their religion is directed to the great central truth in every religion to evolve a god out of man they have not seen the father but they have seen the son and he that has seen the son has seen the father also this brethren is a short sketch of the religious ideas of the hindus the hindu may have failed to carry out all his plans but if there is ever to be a universal religion it must be one which will have no location in place or time which will be infinite like the god it will preach and whose sun will shine upon the followers of krishna and of christ on saints and sinners alike which will not be brahmanic or buddhistic christian or mohammedan but the sum total of all these and still have infinite space for development which in its catholicity will embrace in infinite arms 
and find a place for every human being from the lowest groveling savage, not far removed from the brute, to the highest man towering by the virtues of his head and heart, almost above humanity, making society stand in awe of him and doubt his human nature. It will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity, which will recognize divinity in every man and woman, and whose whole scope, whose whole force will be centered in aiding humanity to realize its own true divine nature. May he, who is the Brahmo of the Hindus, the Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Buddha of the Buddhists, the Jehovah of the Jews, the Father in Heaven of the Christians, give strength to you to carry out your noble idea. The star arose in the east. It travelled steadily towards the west, sometimes dimmed and sometimes effulgent, till it made a circuit of the world. And now it is again rising on the very horizon of the east, the borders of the sun bow, a thousandfold more effulgent than it ever was before.